I have to, we have to leave a little early for Hology, so. Um, we're we're going to do the timekeeper and scribe thing. Who wants to be the timekeeper? Um, I guess I can. There's an agenda. <laughs> it's not a very, there's not many things to keep time of today, I don't think. Okay. What's your talk, Lauren? That's your talk name. Uh, just L -word. But it's different in talk versus Slack, and it's so confusing. Oh. What about a scribe? Anyone want to scribe it up? I'm right now. Oh man, that's awesome. Whoa. Kevin, do I need an airplay? Uh, oh, you gotta switch the input on the projector. Also, I do want to. Um, I'm also going to play a couple of videos. Is that terrible? <laughs> They're like 10 second clips, so it's not that big of a deal. Is there sound? Yes, there is sound. Otherwise, we could. Okay, we'll just do that. I think the most. I don't know if it is or not. Okay. Good to go. Okay, we're gonna do we're gonna do shoutouts. So uh, five minutes of this. What are the shoutouts this week? Kind of like the pop up. I do. Go. Alan totally rocked out cleaning up some code. Nice. Yeah. I'm very happy about every job. Thank you. James has done awesome at forming relationships and leading the charge on Ahology. I feel like his relationship with Mark and those conversations had a lot to do with why they chose to go with Kanban. Yeah. He's really developed some good trust capital there. Nice. I've seen that as well. Good job, James. Shout out to Michelle and the design squad for setting up like a weekly design review. So I'm going to give a shout out to Super Chris for pairing with Joey and like totally helping him out and giving him confidence that I've seen him like from the time that me and Jeff were there to the time now, like his confidence level has gone up. Yeah, I've, I felt like I saw, it seemed like he was spending time here because he wanted to. Yes. Not yeah. because we like asked him to or something. Oh, yeah. And he never that, said boo. He just was like, I'm going to go there. Yeah, so the, the cultural difference there was like enough that he wanted to come here, which I thought was really cool. So yeah. that was good to yeah. see. So probably Even though we're in Blue Ash and not in Hit Mount Lookout. Shout out to the whole Icurio team for shipping both past and present. For shipping that looks, yeah. I saw the happy pictures. It's so cool. <laughs> Smile. All the validation yeah. you need. I'm going to shout out to Doug for taking the lead with recruiting and hiring because he's yes. he did that really well in a short amount of time and yeah, no kidding. felt like he pulled in a lot of people that were <coughs> you know, outside of our normal circles into the office, which was cool, and just good, good attention on it. So. Anyone else? Shout out to Super Chris for helping me out with my apprenticeship. Nice work. Okay. <coughs> Anything else? We're going to close up shop early on the shout outs, I guess. Okay, Kevin, I'm going to do this, so let's hopefully, how do we do speaker notes? <laughs> Sorry, I'm terrible at presentations, this part. You're going to have to reset your display preferences because now you're, you're
might have to restart desktop presenter because I don't think <laughs> it'll know which. No. Well, that's a shame. This shame. Good thing we ended shadows early. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need your notes. I kind of do, actually. Shout out to the shout outs for ending early. <laughs> Shout out to the whole team for their brevity. Worst case scenario, best case scenario totally works. Okay, so now find the desktop presenter app again. Just kill it? No, keep it keep it open, but select the other screen. And then drop down. This from source or selection? So what drop down? Oh, you can't see. What I do? Yeah, source. Okay, restart it. Oh. That? <laughs> no, I just want to re restart <laughs> desktop. I have stand up. So. Yep. Yeah, I'll be back. Uh, it's probably in your finder. Just go to finder. Yep, double click that again. No. Okay, now <coughs> put that source. This? Uh, I think Pro 8300. The going fast, by the way, for those We good to go? Yes, I'm seeing that. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Are you asking for an intervention? Is that what you're so, <laughs> I know Doug gave a talk on Kanban a couple, like last week, a week before. And so you're probably like, oh my gosh, I have to listen to stuff again. But I feel like there's some subtle things about Kanban that, that we could really like focus on and learn a lot from. And I also have a couple, what I feel are very related topics that I think would be a really good addition to our process and helping communication with our clients. So I'm gonna call this talk Kanban from First Principles. So I'm trying to build it up. I'm trying to assume no knowledge that Kanban is a good thing or why you would even think it's a good thing. So if this is a, I just pulled like the top level categories from a Kanban board and <coughs> I want to view this as a system. Some people may have heard of um, systems in terms of like systems thinking. And sorry, I'm trying to get my notes up. Sorry. Why do I not see notes? I guess I'll run with it. So systems are this, this idea that you know there's a, a set of steps and they're somewhat sequential and there's a defined, somewhat defined process and there's always an outcome. And if we think about development, development is a system in the sense that um, we're trying to produce something and we're trying to produce oftentimes their features or user stories but in a sense, the, the goal of the system only acts, is only there in its entirety, and there's very little value of any one step in the system. And this is really hard for us to think about because we think about ourselves as designers or developers, but in a sense where we need to view our contributions in terms of the overall system itself and not in terms of any particular level of effort. So if you look at a normal Kanban board, we have what the percentage project has not had any work started, we see all these cards here. You know, what is the goal? What do we want to do? We want to get everything over here to over there, right? And um, we call this throughput. And in a sense, throughput is the only goal of the system, which means the only reason that we exist as developers or designers or anyone on a project is to actually get stuff into production. And so you have to kind of pretend that you don't care about your technical ability or the, that you want to be a better developer because if you're at a client project, in a sense, you really only want to ship stuff. That's what you're there for. Now we can talk about, you know, outside the scope of being at a project, you have other goals too. But that's really why you exist on the project, right? Otherwise, clients wouldn't want us there. They wouldn't care. They wouldn't pay us. So we call this throughput. That's the idea of moving things through the system. And there's very easy formulas around this. So we can pretend that if we have 12 items and it took us two weeks, we have a throughput of six things per week. So in a sense, this is like a rate. That's where throughput is, is essentially a rate. So 
this brings the question, why don't, why don't we just do all these things? You know, if it's like we just want to move things from this column to this column, why don't we just do that? What's the best way to make sure that happens? And as an experiment, we could try to utilize all of our capacity, right? This is an attempt at utilizing your capacity where we have just, we'll just get it, we'll just start it all with this, like everyone's going to work 100%, no stopping, just all the time, you know, if you get stuck on any one item, we're just going to keep going. And uh, there's some compelling reasons to try this approach because it makes people look very efficient in terms of they're always busy. And it's kind of like the default response by a lot of development teams. But we're going to watch a really quick video on high density. Oops, that didn't work. There we go. Uh oh, wrong screen. <coughs> Yeah, you're gonna have to, it's that's okay. It's not that the audio is not that long or important. It's a traffic experiment, right? Okay, so if you didn't catch the audio there. They're doing this traffic experiment where they're trying to get to a certain speed with a certain density of cars, and they're really not able to get above 50 miles an hour with this number of cars on the track. For the video? Yeah. Okay. Well, th I'm, we're done watching for now, but I can for the next one. So, there's another video coming next, but they're all like specific links in there. So when we have like really high density, by default, things are, are going to have to go slower. It's impossible for them not to. And I think we all like we all see that when we are working on stories, right? We have too much in progress. Like you're going to make slower progress in terms of the system. Now, you as a developer might be going quickly, but the system's throughput, which is really what we care about, doesn't get any faster and actually slows down usually. <clears throat> Another side effect of this is is what happens when you have. So we, we have like high density and we have minor disturbances and we see like any problems that happen are going to cascade throughout the system, right? And if we think again about the system's goal, which, produce, which is producing throughput, like that becomes much more irregular as we have so much density and so many things going on at once. And then one more little traffic experiment. Sorry, I'm not seeing the value going full screen just for... 10 seconds. Okay, so let's hope, I hope the analogy is pretty transferable to what we do. But the idea, again, is when we reduce density, like things are going to have to speed up just because there's more room for them to, you know, buffer between each other. You see the cars, when they have uh, less density, they can speed up a little bit more. And they're not as worried about hitting the next one in front of them. Um, so this is, this. when I saw these videos, I was like, man, this is exactly why we say we should limit whip. And when we just say, oh, we need to limit whip, Sometimes I was like, really? Should we really do that? Why not just like keep going? You know, what's what's the driving force to really slow down? And uh, so speed is like a really fundamental part of this. Like inherently you have to be going slower when there's more things going on at once. But there's actually a, another subtle thing at play here related to density, what we call whip. And, you know, I thought to myself like, well, if we get two things done at half the speed of the one, then it's no big difference. You know, you just like, you know, you're, each one's going slower by themselves, but you can push through more through the system at once. That's actually, that's partially true that that could be the case. However, there is another side effect of what we call like work in progress. 
And work in progress, if you think of it in terms of like a factory, is essentially inventory. And in order to <coughs> produce things in a factory, you need, you need inventory of parts to become like, you know, the next step in the process. And inventory is usually viewed in a factory, like traditionally on the balance sheet, it's an asset, which means, hey, if we shut down the plant, we could take that inventory and sell it. So it's worth something. So usually inventory was seen as like value, as in it's like a good thing. And having more inventory just meant you had more money on the books, right? That's actually, in the last 50 years, and this is like the whole lean movement really kind of turned that notion on its head. And <clears throat> the reason that it was seen differently is inventory is like money that's stuck in the system. It's, it's money that is invested in the development column, but it's never, it's like trapped there. And so if you always have 10 things in progress in development, that means you have 10 developer capacity units or whatever you want to measure that is that can never be pulled out of the system. So it's kind of like when we bill and we have clients that like owe us money, like let's say $100,000, we almost always have money outstanding in AR, which means we, have, we own this money, but we actually never have the ability to realize it. And yes, we get paid, but then by the time we get paid, we have the no another cycle out there. Right, so this is another system in a sense. We have like a development system where we can build things and ship features to production, but we also have a system when, with our business when it comes to consulting of like selling a project, billing every two weeks, and then actually collecting the money. So these are, this is just another system. And systems are interdependent and there's like subsystems involved too. But we don't really think about like the, the money and resources that are trapped in the system but can never escape fully. And this is another really good reason to limit work in progress. And for development, especially, here's an example of like this trapped, you know, if you always have six things in development, that means you always have resources and time dedicated to stuff that is not in production. Sorry, I started talking ahead of some of these slides. Um, and again, the, the, you know, the value of the system is throughput itself. So let's talk a little bit about bottlenecks and we'll talk a little bit more about like the, the inherent problems with WIP but <clears throat> if we view a system and we view this like sequential steps that need to happen and let's say that we can only produce two widgets per week at one of our machines in a factory line let's say they're like 10 stops and you only have you know one of the machines that is critical only produces two things per week it is absolutely wasteful to do anything more than two items per week at any other stop in the factory because the value of the system, its capacity is, is determined based on that bottleneck and you cannot outpace it. There's nothing you can do. You can't be more efficient ahead of the bottleneck. Even if that happens, all you do is build up inventory, which is just money that sits there that can't be realized. You know, the, the bottleneck's not gonna get any faster unless you address it directly. And this is a really good reason for us as developers and designers to not get ahead of ourselves. You know, designing like 20 stories ahead of time is probably really wasteful for a lot of reasons. Same thing with, you know, developing features that we think we're going to need. This is like money that's trapped in the system. It it's represents effort that we've put in that can't necessarily ever be recovered. And even if it is, it's uncertain. And development, you know, there's software projects are less predictable in some ways than like manufacturing. But again, like viewing this constraint as like an ultimate limiter is really important and that actually, like the constraint of your system is the, is defines capacity for throughput in general. And th when I, I read this book recently called The Goal that talks about this concept and it was kind of enlightening to me because, you know, we think a lot of times in terms of like individual components in the system, but really like the constraint defines the system in a sense. And you can waste money either by not addressing that constraint or attempting to work harder than that constraint when it can't really be changed. And I think this is like a whole other talk about how to identify constraints in our development projects in terms of like our interactions with our clients and, you know, like talking about how much work they can absorb of us, like how many times we can ship things and, the, you know, whether or not they can accept things fast enough. There's a lot of topics that we could talk about here and a lot of potential for like really good consulting work that we can do. And actually like we can also sell services that we haven't, we've kind of like artificially held ourselves back a little bit because we've been like, oh, they can only accept three things per week because their BA is like, doesn't have enough time. Well, we should fix that, right? We can, we can find ways to help them improve whether it's like 
pushing for them to be full time in the project or whatever it is, like that constraint ultimately will always limit the project. I'm probably talking past some of these slides again. So um, when we have, you know, like I said, when we have more whip, we have less throughput. We talked about this, like in terms of the density. Another, um, so here's like a factor with all this inventory. You know, this is all like money that's sitting there, and unless they can sell all that stuff, like really soon, it's, it's not going to turn into money. Even though they could sell that inventory itself as an asset, in terms of like the system's throughput is not valuable. There's a lot of opportunity cost of carrying that inventory. Exactly. Yeah. So there's also, most, most of the time you get taxed at the end of the year based on how much inventory you have. Yeah. yeah. So, so usually like on the balance sheet, which is, you know, a financial statement, this is viewed as like money that's in the bank. And that's true in the sense that they could sell it. But again, like Alan said, it's an opportunity cost because it really represents money that they could have spent somewhere else to like reduce a bottleneck. And I don't even know if this is, this is just like a warehouse that is not a picture, but. And it's risk. Yeah. Because if that stuff is all for a certain version of something, mm. and they keep making that version, and they make mm. a good version. This is why, like, this is really what would uh, set off the lean manufacturing revolution. So let's, I just pulled up like the T map, you can see here. I mean, this is like, this is inventory in a sense, right? You have like parallel development streams, you have dead branches that don't do, oh, that's a stash, but you have dead branches that don't do anything. Like this is, this is just money that's sitting there and will never be recovered in a sense. Especially if it's money that was tried, that we spent in an attempt to be faster than what our bottleneck could actually um, receive. So this is a this is a good argument for why you shouldn't feel guilty when your client isn't accepting things, and you know because you can't like you can't ship features faster than they can accept them, and you shouldn't feel guilty about sitting there and not doing anything. I mean, yeah, you can like make continuous improvements around refactoring your code or whatever it is, but you don't want to be like building the next feature experimentally when you don't know for sure that's really valuable. I have a question regarding that. Like, when we talk about saving money because of the throughput of the system, like here anyway, even if we ship a bunch of stuff, like Joel and I have run into this couple times, where we ship a bunch of stuff and we decide, like, okay, there are like six stories outstanding, we need to stop. So when you stop, though, we as developers are still getting paid. Yeah. And there's no work being done. Like, how does that compensate for like the throughput of the system? Well, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But it's a very good point. And sometimes, like, the pain that's associated with, the, with that and how we want to transfer that pain to our clients in a very kind and gentle way is really an encouragement for them to reduce a bottleneck in the system. That's what we want to do. Like, that conversation shouldn't be, oh, we're going to stop because you have too much in acceptance, which is what we've said before. And I think that's, like, that's true, but at the same time, what we're really trying to say is we can't ultimately give you more value because of this limiting factor in the system. Let's find a way to work around the system, and then we can ramp up production again. And, I, and there's nuances around development work. So what you're talking about, in a sense, is something called local efficiencies, OK? It's very tempting to view, in a, in a factory, like you want to know the cost per machine per part, right? And what happened in factories a lot of times is they would, they would increase batch sizes in order to be more efficient on paper. They would say, this machine can take 50 parts at once. Why would we not fill it up all the way? We can reduce our cost per part to do that, right? Which is, is somewhat true. It, it looks better on paper. And accounting systems actually work this way. They view like cost-based accounting looks at how much it costs per part to do this work. And people, like this is how they judge performance in a lot of cases. But what they don't see is the fact that when you're talking about a system that goes all the way across the spectrum, looking at any one column in isolation is really worthless because that doesn't actually produce value by itself. And so there's like a whole set of practices around this when it's, ca it's called like value added accounting or something like that or value added mm -hmm. cost basis. And what they're trying to do is like break down the in incremental cost, you know, like how much does it cost for a designer to design this feature? How much does it cost for a developer to build this feature? Well, worrying about those things in isolation is like a somewhat as a, a stupid exercise because you really care about like the throughput. That's really when you get value delivered in a sense. So as long as you're like maximizing the throughput, the local efficiencies don't matter. And if they do, all that does is reveal like there's a bottleneck somewhere in the system and you should remove that rather than you should try to 
you know, like make everyone more efficient. Now, again, with like development, we know there's like always stuff you could do that will add value when it's like refactoring or design tweaks, like little stuff like that. Like you have to balance that against the overall goal of the system in a sense. So that's like a kind of like a, you know, asterisk <coughs> conversation for later to tag. It reminds me a lot of um, when people got really hung up on measuring velocity yeah. in projects and would optimize for velocity. But it turns out that's actually not that useful because what you really want to optimize is software going into production. Yeah. It was like a sub optimization that just made everything worse. And this is really why, in a sense, like we stopped billing per hour. You know, like because you view this column of development or design as being like a goal by itself. Like we need to pay that person per hour to do this. When, in a sense, what they're really paying for is like what comes out the other side of the system. That's what you care about. You know, you don't care about what happens here you, in the middle as long as the throughput is there. And so as long as we're like maximizing that, the stuff in the middle is totally, doesn't matter. Like if you're, if you're trying to pay someone just to keep them busy, you're just investing money in something that will never actually increase revenue itself. So this is like a, again, there's a lot of conversations here that we could learn to have with our clients about how to view the goal of the system in general in terms of like throughput and not necessarily like an activity in isolation that they see. So we're gonna to switch topics a little bit. This is like, a, I think a really interesting topic and there's a lot of cool things we could continue to go into depth here about, but I would recommend that we read this book. I read it, it's called The Goal. It's actually 30 years old and it's like this business novel about like a failing manufacturing plant. There's a, there's a more recent one called um, the Phoenix Project, which is like the same exact, it's like basically copies it, but it's like an IT department set and it was written a couple of years ago, so it's much more like up to date. But I read it and I was like, man, this is like super cool. And the cool thing about the book is it never mentions Lean or Kanban at all, even though the guy was like basically, I mean, he didn't start it because it was really like started by Ono from Toyota, but he was like kind of brought it into common practice in a lot of ways in industry. So <clears throat> we're going to talk now about the pull system. And here's a, you know, Kanban, which is as far as I can tell the best way to pronounce it in Japanese, like the video you posted. I took Japanese for a year and I'm pretty sure it's Kanban. So Kanban is like literally, it means signal card. Okay. And let's talk about like, we talked about this density of cars moving. And you know, when you have like certain density, you can't move any faster. So I have a question then. A train has extremely high density, but it can move much faster than 20 hours per hour. 20 miles per hour, 20 miles per hour. Yeah. right? You have a train that is very dense and you have a car, these cars that are spaced and you can never move as quickly as a train could with that level of density in a car. So why is that? Well, sure, but, but why, is, why is that actually the case? And if you think about it. Because it's not a system. Sure it is. Well, I mean. It's not really, it's got one part. So I think the, the because subtle reason. Because of tight coupling. The, well, yes, that's true. So here's like, here's the real reason. And this is like, I, this is literally true. And it's also like true in the sense of like an analogy to Kanban. A train implements pull, right? <clears throat> A train like literally is saying, if you viewed a train like each of these cars here as a column in our system right here, what each of those cars is saying is, you can move as soon as I'm in the next column, right? That's exactly what pull is. When we talk about pulling in Kanban, you're just saying like, okay, you can come. And, but each car is saying that in exact timing with every other car, which is why they can move at such high density. I mean, that's literally how they work, right? They're just fixed together so they by definition have to do that. Like the laws of physics wouldn't allow it another way. But that's well, actually, <laughs> but it is interesting to think like if you could have like simultaneous pull with everyone else, you can move faster and faster and faster and faster. Okay, so the thing about this of course is that trains are very regular. Like each car is exactly the same size and each car moves at the exact same speed because they're like fixed to each other. We know that development does not work that way. You know, like stories can be, the same story could take design 10 minutes and development 10 days. And the next story could be like five hours in design and like one minute in development. You know, there, or some could skip one of those stages. So d development is like, is not nearly as regular as a train. But we can still learn something from pull here. And the way that we work with this unpredictable pace is that we 
find a way to mitigate some of the costs of unpredictability. And um, again, we're trying to keep these somewhat opposing, when we're working with an unpredictable system, we have these somewhat, somewhat opposing um, goals where we don't want to outpace our bottleneck. You never want to do more than what your bottleneck can handle. At the same time, like your bottleneck changes from story to story every single day, right? And that's like a really hard, how do you optimize that kind of system? Well, you can do a couple things. And I think one of them is, um, yeah, I get it. don't outpace your bottlenecks. But this is where you use buffers, okay? And buffers are something we have a hard time seeing in like our Trello boards. And actually buffers are really pull columns. That's what they are, right? So this is a, a lean kit board. And so I created like in progress, ready to pull for each of these columns. And if you think about it, this ready to pull column, we were saying, I'm done with this. You can pick it up whenever you're ready. And I have a whip limit of one in each of these. That's what a pull column is, in a sense, is it operates as a buffer. So that allows there to be this, I don't, if there was a card here, like, we don't know, we can't predict how long it's going to take for the story to be completed by the next person who's working on it. But if we give ourselves a little bit of buffer, one card, let's say, which is really the ready to pull column, then we can mitigate some of that effect of unpredictable stories. And since I'm going to give this talk at Hology and talk a little bit about, you know, we already know this stuff, but like, what we're actually talking about the time that it takes to get through the system, but not the waiting time in front of the cycle time. Lead time is all that plus the time it waited. We know that kind of stuff. But um, I think these, like, these pull columns could really help us achieve some of the effects of buffer, some of the benefits of buffering. Is there a reason we don't do that with Trello? You just throw another column. Yeah, you could. I think because, that's a good question. I think one of the tenets of Kanban, which I'm gonna talk about in a second, even though this stuff is pretty basic for us, um, in terms of like how to implement it is, a lot of times we don't change the process as much as we really should. You know, we, we don't really, we're not as flexible as we really should be with Kanban. We kind of assume the board is a certain way and it just needs to stay that way. Some projects are better at that than others, but it's a good idea, I think. I do feel like if you use pull columns really well and you had strict whip limits around them, then what that does is like you have to, you could view violations of whip, of your whip limit as an, it's like an immediate reveal of a bottleneck, right? And that, the bottleneck, as we said, can change from story to story or from design to development or development to testing acceptance. And if you had that really strict adherence to this and you had a team that was like fully dedicated, so that means your product owner is available, like you could essentially expedite any bottleneck because as soon as you got past that one card limit or whatever we want to say it is, maybe it really does deserve to be two, you know, you would like, once you're trying to push in ready to pull and you can't, that would be like an immediate signal you should go talk to your product owner and get them to help out. And the problem we have with a lot of our clients is they're not available as much as we want. And I think that's like, again, something that we can, we can improve that. We should have that relationship where we can get them to give us more time or maybe they needed like coaching around that and we should sell them a product owner coach who can help them with their, this kind of problem. But that's a good question. Maybe we should try it in Trello. Because I think, I think it would be valuable to be more strict about it. And I think not just because, oh, it's the policy, but if you think about, again, like the ideal of what a train does where it has like simultaneous pull and that's what makes it move fast and high density. That's the kind of thing that's like a really um, efficient system in a sense that's still producing a lot of throughput with very little inventory. Yeah, four minutes. Okay. What's that? There's no gap between the pool and delivery. So it's like literally as fast as you can optimize. Exactly. Yeah, you couldn't go any faster, right? You could, all you could do is just decrease the cycle time and that would automatically transfer to everything else. So we're never gonna get there as development because we're not as predictable, but we can make these adjustments and I think this kind of stuff would help. So the next part is really just like how to implement Kanban. Um, we know this stuff. I guess the question is do we actually like do it even instead of just saying we know how to do it. So the first one again is like to map your process and to be descriptive, not prescriptive. So you don't wanna try to like idealize your process. Oh, it needs to be handed off this person, then this person's gonna touch it. Like, you just wanna see where things literally are today. 
and to be very honest with yourself about that. And I think this is, this should mean our board should change more often. We should do that. Um, and then you should, you know, like changing that process and what it looks like is a result of evaluating the system and seeing the bottlenecks and things like that. So the next thing that we want to do um, is, you know, map your process. We want to limit WIP to some degree and you need to like set a benchmark. And, you know, Doug said there's not like a good way of knowing for sure, but we've seen the examples of like when you lower your density, you go faster. You'd like to go faster and increase your density, but it's easier to start with low density, higher speed and then build from there. And you have very little to lose. You know, what's the worst thing you're going to do is someone's going to be like, oh, I could, I could start another story now. And they would, the team would make that decision if they could handle it or not. And this next one, focus on flow, I think is a tool problem in a lot of ways for us. Like our board in the back doesn't tell us things about flow improvements unless we just see them. You know, we can see like a cluster of cards that sat there. But we really don't have a good way of like knowing that things have been a problem in terms of like actual metrics. Trello is kind of the same way, you know, I mean, I've written some stuff around Trello that should calculate lead time and cycle time, but it's just really hacky. And if you move a column or rename a column, it breaks and it's just kind of terrible. So I, I posted in Slack when I was doing these mockups in LeanKit, like when you set a whip limit in LeanKit like it, and you drag over, you literally have to give a reason for why you're violating whip and put in a message I thought was pretty cool. Even though the UI is not nearly as friendly as Trello. But the idea is like when you focus on flow, you're, you're constantly evaluating your system to pay attention to flow because we don't, like, we don't care about like one column, you know, we don't care if the development team did like an awesome job this week by themselves. That's not important. We want to see that things are actually being produced through the system. That's what you care about. And getting the team to care about that, the whole flow and not just like their work is important. And I think that's where we have conversations like people asking each other, like, why has that been sitting there for two days? You know, that's the kind of question that should reveal a lot of in interesting information and will ultimately allow us to continuously improve, which is part of the <coughs> idea of Kanban is that you can't really improve your process unless you understand what's actually going on. And you can't really understand what's going on unless you honestly can see your bottlenecks. And the only way to see your bottlenecks is to see where the pain is and see where things are not flowing smoothly. Yeah, exactly. So Doug talked about the Kanban book. I put that up just because I'm, like I said, giving this talk at Ology. Um, I thought it was, I thought it was a pretty good book. It's got a little dry for me, honestly. Like it felt like a lot of like somewhat interesting case studies. It was good reading, but it wasn't. It didn't like completely get me excited. Um, so it's kind of good reference material. Personally, I feel like this next book, which looks really really cheesy or something, is amazing. <laughs> this was published like 30 years ago and it's like required reading in most business schools. It's kind of dated in some ways like the examples are probably not super up to date in terms of like the industry but in terms of like the concepts it's it was like it was completely changed my point of view on this stuff and made me understand like this is why we do Kanban too. This is why Kanban like has to help you and if it's not helping you you're lying to yourself. <laughs> so are we going to switch to link I think we should try it on a project. Yeah. Like I said, the, so this is the end, so I guess we can do some q and I feel like if you actually want to focus on the things that Kanban tries to help you do, Trello will never, unless they like create some sort of additional offerings, like it just won't do that for you. I think LeanKit gives you a lot of cool options in terms of like managing your flow, but it's, it's not as fun to use as Trello, for sure. You know, and I feel like I could live with most of it, but the one thing in Trello that's gonna really, I'm really gonna miss is a card. Like, I feel like the, the card editor in Trello is like perfect. Oh yeah. So. And everything else sucks. <laughs> like, just, it just is terrible. So I, I've been playing with Blossom a little bit too, and they have some cool things. Like they have the ready to pull built in, which is nice. One thing that, there's some like annoying stuff, like the card again is not as good as Trello's card is, but you can't move cards between boards and that seems like a really big problem because they have like this huge system, because you know the system is like really valuable in terms of like 
developing a product to actually selling it and someone like Ecology where they have like going to production and like talking with their brands. This is like, again, we're talking about a system, right? That's producing revenue for their company. That's where the value is, but you can't, and I think you want to view the whole system at the same time, like it makes sense to somewhat limit your team's focus. So they're, they're responsible for the development side of the system, right? And these systems like are inputs and outputs to each other. And if you can't do that effectively, like you're just gonna have this board that's like 20 columns long and that's just kind of crazy. So I think they're gonna fix it, but it's been like an open request for two years. So I don't know, it's, <coughs> Joel? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's really good talk, man. Um, I thought when you, so I got really kind of into this idea of like the only thing that matters is the, the spirit set, right? Kind of the beginning and the end. Yeah. And, and when we're talking about like actually describing our process and being, not being prescriptive. I mean, I felt like when you said we're going to be experiment, let's try to experiment, it was going to be like, Let's start with those two lanes, right? And it's just like, mm. for any, like maybe for any given project, you start with those two. And the first time somebody picks up a card, you add a lane for whatever kind of work that is, mm. right? And then if, if there's different kinds of work that people pick up that card for, that's when you add the new lane in. Yeah. Um, I think that would be an interesting experiment to, to do yeah. for sure. Um, I could see you adopting this for that kind of thing. Yeah. I've, I've wanted to, like, I wanted to, my idea for this talk was to take this book, it kind of popularizes this thing called the theory of constraints, which at the end of the day is like the most obvious thing in the world, you know? You can't go any faster than your bottleneck, so you need to find your bottleneck, you need to do the best you can to address that bottleneck, and then you need to, like, everything in the system should be at capacity with your bottleneck. And optimizing locally, apart from your constraint, is never a good idea. And then, you know, finally, the last thing is like, once you think you've solved one bottleneck problem, you need to reevaluate everything because your bottleneck changes all the time. And that happens like all the time for us. So, the concept in the book is really interesting in terms of it's like a focus on the process and how it fits into Kanban was what I was really interested by. Well, the card represents the card represents value once real once like completed by the system. Mm -hmm. That's what I think would be the the problem with that. Well, you just merge it at the end, right? But that that yeah. just represents inventory then, right? That's what you're doing is you're increasing inventory in a sense. So I think at the end of the day, it's like if well, it's like a res like I mean, the thing is like you've got a limited sure. amount of resources. You've got width, and like Kenny and I are both working on the same thing. Yeah. Well, there's no so, cosmic force that's going to yell at you if you have a designer come over your computer when it's in development. You know. What's that? There's no cosmic force that's going to yell at you if your designer comes to talk to you when it's in the development column. You know. So maybe I mean, if it, if you see that a lot, if you see like design development working at the same time on the same card. Yeah. Then maybe design and development is a column. Yeah. And I think that's I think that's the key right there is you're kind of saying like those columns are not really different, right? Yeah. It's an artificial separation. If that's really how you produce value in that project and every project is different and like the nature of how you interact with design is different in every project and, and differs from card to card. At the end of the day, it's like, does it really matter? You know, it doesn't matter that much, but the- It's like if, that's, if that separation is your Yeah, so I think there's, and again, the car can go back and forth between two columns. But I, I hear what you're saying. It's like, it's kind of in limbo mode. And again, it's like, are you talking about, when you're saying something is in design, does that mean that someone who's a designer is working on it or they're writing CSS? What is, what are you talking about, you know? And again, like, there's nothing that says when 
someone types starts opening a SAS file, then you have to move it back to the design yeah, column. Exactly. You know, there's like nothing that's going to make you do that. So you have to think in terms of like, what is the system's, how does this fit into the system's process for producing value? And again, like the design development distinction is really more in terms of like, so we can understand what's going on better. So if you're like on the same page as your designer, then I'm not worried about that as long as you're not like obscuring work and incurring a lot of like, you know, time moving back and forth between columns and it's causing miscommunication or something. Yeah, I, I mean, to me, it almost feels like design development. There's like an actual design column and then there's a working column, right? And the de actual design column is I'm trying to understand this and what the aesthetic should be and, and really what the functionality and behavior should be of something. Those are two and then once, once I know everything, I can about that, we can actually work on it, right? But you can't work on it until then. Yeah, and I think I could even imagine situations where our de design development teams work so closely that they just call it, yeah. you know, a mixed column. Which is ironic just because I feel like we, we got into all <laughs> this stuff. But again, there's no reason you couldn't have one project doing it one way and one doing it the other way, you know? Yeah, yeah. I was just thinking, it almost seems like it shouldn't be a problem because if Kanban started out in manufacturing, right? This is how manufacturing works. You don't start out with a car and then move it to this stage, move it to this stage. But, you know, you get the doors from one of your factories. And yeah. You paint those doors and the seats come in. At the end of the day, you have a car. Right, so it just seems like there should be some way to model what we're doing. So I think what, what we're saying, though, in a sense is it's like the, the steps representing a, a Kanban card are not necessarily a thing that's actually producing value. They could be like an intermediate part that's like part of the process. Right. So I think it kind of, it's, it's kind of like a modeling problem. How do you yeah, model what's going like on? You want like different cards that almost like merge together at some point, you know, because it can't be accepted until the design is done and development. So, so it's kind of like the storyboarding that Doug talked about, right? It's in a sense, but the problem then is I just see a lot of danger there in doing work that's not ultimately tied to something that produces value in the end. That's what I see, because I, I think what you're doing then is you're, in a sense, increasing inventory. Right. You're, yeah. you're increasing... Well, you're modeling the inventory better, I would That say. might be the case, but yeah. the problem is does modeling better also let you work on things that don't have a clear tie back to any value. That's what I'd be worried about. Like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna design this feature ahead of time, right? right. Like, I'm gonna, I'm, I have some capacity to work on this feature and then they'll work on the development next week. In a sense, like, I think in some ways, like having the strict, the cards, the number of cards is, an, is a, a smell around the whip and which is essentially inventory. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, these are hard conversations. And I think teams, like, we need to be able to have these conversations at a team level where, we understand the concepts. We understand like how this stuff fits what we're trying to ultimately achieve, and then we can hash out the details of what's going to work for our team. And I don't think we need to be like really dogmatic about this is the way it has to be. You know, like some teams are really mature around this stuff, and I know, you know, like if and again projects like change. You know, you can be in a period where it's like really hard to know what you're building, and sometimes you're just like killing features left and right, and everything's getting done, and it can look different in those situations. It feels like these kind of conversations or the confusion surrounding these conversations, though, are more of like uh, indicative of like a problem with modeling the process. Like it seems like, for instance, with the design development stuff, like maybe we're just getting too granular with that. I, and I think a lot of that is the fact that we are unlike a lot of companies in that our developers don't do the majority of our CSS. But like writing CSS and writing code are both still developing the feature. And that I think the design column is in the traditional sense of like waterfall design of like design it first, then make it. Yeah. And we're trying to sort of like pigeonhole that into design is what designers do and development is what developers do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's the same thing I was trying to point out and you articulated it much better than I did else. Yeah, maybe just design and development are like not good common names at all. Yeah. Design it's possible. a good common name for like making wireframes, but maybe... How about wireframes? Like yeah. Yeah. Planning. Yeah. Let's say I mean, planning. <laughs> yeah. UI planning, well, which is planning, a lot. Yeah. Less. UI planning, development, and then. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. I mean, at the end of the day, like, <laughs> your column shouldn't be based on the file yeah, extension name, designer, right? That's right. that's a stupid yeah. thing to design a column around. So. But again, like, I think, 
when I started talking, viewing this topic in terms of like a system that was really interesting to me, and especially in terms of like what the system is trying to do and what value throughput provides and how that changes our conversation or with our clients. And even like in terms of like how we run our business too, like that's, you know, like the fact that you have AR sitting out there for a long time is a liability and it is a bottleneck in a sense to actually receiving money. Yeah, I think, I mean, I could see every one of our clients getting a lot out of this. I think it should be, like, required, like, you have to go through Kanban training with us, and this is how we work, and this is why we work this way. Yeah. I so, feel like it answers a lot of questions. Did you feel like this presentation of the topic was emphasized different things that were helpful? But Sorry. Were you, I think there are a lot of good analogies that business people can relate to, like the inventory yeah. and the train. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I think I think you could... We. You're teaching us from a standpoint of like we already know most of this, yeah. But you're just kind of reiterating some stuff. I think if you were going to do it to someone who had never heard Kanban, you probably want want to start off with like a simple, you know, yeah, simpler. Level. Yeah, but it I really. It was very good. Yeah. Oh yeah, I was going to say it really was interesting to me. Like concentrate. It's like not how like how much time a developer is spending on this thing. It's like what you get in the end. I think that's like a really important. Yeah. concept and mm -hmm. I think it usually takes a while for a new client to grasp that's really what's good and this is what I'm getting at the end I'm getting these usable things versus like well you know like this little thing it, yeah especially because most of them probably do bill hourly mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. well, yes I agree and I think I think that helps help swallow the pill of this weekly rate yeah so yeah and it shouldn't be a, it sh the idea is that you're aligning how you pay for the project in terms of like what you actually want to get, you know, you don't want hours. Hours are just money but some that some people might think they need hours. They, yeah, that's an education problem, yeah. right? And that's also a sales problem to a degree. So, so that's the other thing. It's just like you know, a lot of people see, oh, we're really busy. Let's throw, let's hire more people, right? Because that'll fix the problem. Well, busy may be the problem, right? Yeah. I find it interesting, like, when I was hired on to Meyer Tool, the first two weeks, I had to go through lean manufacturing training and then get and then get trained on running their actual machines, even though I was never going to actually touch a machine. And at first, I thought that was kind of stupid, but the longer I'm, like, consulting, the more I think it was actually kind of brilliant. Um, because it meant even the developers had an idea of what the throughput in the factory looked like and where bottlenecks were and what the day-to-day -day operations were like. And um, the lean manufacturing stuff is all very, very similar and applicable to this. Yeah. Yeah, the manufacturing analogies are always interesting, but they have a lot of caveats. Yeah. Just, you know. But the, the uh, that's why I felt like it's important to understand like the differences, but also the analogy. Like in an ideal world, this is why it would be like super awesome. This is how development causes problems because of all these other things. Well, I actually, we need to get going to Hology, so um, this is probably gonna end a little early, but we probably should, you guys can talk about like retreat questions or maybe someone can. I'll answer, I don't know anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> like I can facilitate. Yeah. We'll wake them up. Yes, um, no. consumed, it's it will be provided. Yes. It will be provided by us. Why are they? We're no, they talk about me.